at a youth hostel, a high rolling youth hostel, and I hobbled around. We had a cheap ticket, one that <laughs> if you changed it, you'd have to pay a full fare. We couldn't afford that. So anyway, we were stuck here for about a week. Now, God arranges everything if we ask Him, and He gives us the proper motives if we ask Him. In other words, we human beings have tendencies that are not good. Basically, they, uh, our ancestors all the way down, you know, we have inherited some uh, tendencies for evil. The Bible says the natural heart is enmity with God. And so I think all of us know that. Uh, but anyway, God promises that he will write his laws upon the fleshy tables of our heart. He'll give us his Holy Spirit to help us resist things that are self-destructive that are dishonoring God and that will keep us from being used by God to help other people. So anyway, I ask God to help me find, document, and be able to share the way he wanted it shared everything that he wanted shared with the world. Okay. When I prayed that prayer back in 1976, I was impressed to go look for Noah's Ark. So I asked for a sign. There was a charter flight leaving for Turkey in one week. And uh, I talked to the travel agent and said that I would like to go. They said, sorry, but they asked if I had a passport. I said, no. And so anyway, my sign was that I would get a passport in time to get a seat on that plane. So my passport came back, I got a seat on the plane, and then my two sons wanted to go with me. And there was like uh, six days left or less uh, when they decided. I hadn't got my passport back yet, but they said, we want to go. And I said, you can't, it's impossible. They said, well, let's ask for a sign. So we prayed, we quick sent off for their passports by express mail. One of, one of their passports got back in three days and we hadn't covered the possibility that one son was supposed to go and the other one wasn't. You know how it is to be a human, we think of things after. Uh, so anyway, five days and his came we called the travel agent and they said, sorry, the flight is closed, nobody, that's it. I said, well, would you just please call New York and see if they might have two seats for my son. They said, it's no, you know, there's no reason to do that, but if it'll make you happy, we'll call. So about 20 minutes later, they call me back and they said, well, there's two seats. Two people canceled out, so you, there's two seats. If you bring the cash out here, we'll make the reservations and do a bank transfer. So anyway, there we were out in eastern Turkey. When we got out by Noah's Ark, <coughs> it was dark mountains all over the place, you know, like down in Sinai pretty much, not that much different. And so how do you find a boat and all of that? So we said a prayer, we asked God to have the taxi motor die at a 90 degree angle from to the ark, from the road. So we were driving along the road, the motor died. We got out and put up a pile of stone. Got back in, the fella got it running again. Went about a quarter of a mile and it died again. So there we put another pile of stones. 
and then it went about the same distance and it died again. So we began to think we're just having motor trouble and this isn't of God. Well, don't ever be fooled by that. God had more things to show us than we thought were out there. So we got one rock each and put them at that last place. The next morning we came out and we went back from the first pile of rocks, we found the anchor stone. Okay? And then we went across to the line from the other place the motor had died, rather than coming all the way back to the road and going all the way back out. And there we found Noah's house and uh, his and his wife's grave markers with petroglyphs on them, showing that uh, a family of eight on Noah's stone, it had the biggest person, and then petroglyphs, that's how you designate the most important person in the group. And his head was down and his eyes were closed, indicating that he was dead. However, on his tomb, his wife's head was down and her eyes closed, and when I looked at her grave marker, it had the eight people on there, and she was the only one that had her head down and her eyes closed, so the wife died first. Okay? But anyway, all of that is in a book. So Noah's Ark was all that I thought about finding, and by the way, from the first place it had stopped when we went straight back from that, there was Noah's Ark, what was left of it. So that was it. I was delighted. I figured my life was worthwhile. God had let me accomplish something useful with it. Before the end of 1978, I knew where Noah's Ark was. I knew where the Red Sea crossing was. I knew how to build pyramids. Uh, I knew that the Mount Sinai was over from the crossing site. And when we, I got sunburned so I couldn't get the chariot carts out of the Red Sea and came up here, I met a colonel that uh, was in charge of this part of Jerusalem for antiquities. And ordinarily those kinds of people are busy, you don't see them, nothing. And uh, we struck up a conversation and uh, I told him how the pyramids were built, I drew him a little sketch, and uh, so I guess the Holy Spirit impressed him, you know, to listen, and so then I told him about the Red Sea crossing, I told him about the pillar that we saw by moonlight, it was laying in the water in the edge of the sea, and the Israelis were about to blast this mountain off, which would have covered it up. So anyway, I, I said, that's important out there. It marks the crossing site. So I guess he called somebody and got it put up where we saw it. So anyway, <laughs> the prophecy in Isaiah 1919 guaranteed that that pillar would be out there, if you know what I mean. It had to happen. Satan can do many things, but when God prophesies something, that is not a conditional prophecy, it happens. So anyway, I was walking along the cliff base behind this bus station back in this area. Well, since you saw the cutouts, okay, I was walking through there. My left hand went out without my brain doing it. And my mouth said, that's Jeremiah's Grotto and the Ark of the Covenant's in there. Well, I was dumbfounded. This sort of thing doesn't happen to me. In fact, you know, I resist to that sort of thing because people that I consider wackos say they have those kinds of experiences. And I still think that most of them that say they have these experiences are wackos. But <clears throat> sometimes... In other words, I don't feel comfortable with that kind of experience. 
but our tickets were due the next morning, so we flew home. I told the man, he said, that's wonderful. He says, we'll let you dig there. We'll give you all the help you need, a place to stay, provide you food, do your laundry. And this is a uh, Israeli. They don't do that. Is that Colonel I won't name names at this point in time. So anyway, <coughs> we went home, and I had no idea why the Ark of the Covenant had been there. I never even thought about it. You know, my cup was running over already with things that God has shown me. And so, you know, I was not looking for anything else. So I went home, prayed, and asked the Lord to help me understand why the Ark of the Covenant might possibly be in that place. I was impressed to read the history of the conquest of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king at that time. And in this uh, Second Kings chapter 25, and the last part of that chapter, it says that Nebuchadnezzar built forts against the city round about. That in modern uh, language is a siege wall. Now this meant that nobody could take anything out of the city or bring anything in the city. So the Ark of the Covenant had to be hidden in the city, under the city, or inside the siege wall. All right? Well, <clears throat> we don't know for sure where the Babylonian siege wall was located, but we know where Titus's siege wall was located. All right? Catapults had the same range back in Nebuchadnezzar's time as they did in Titus's time. And they always built these siege walls out of range of the catapults that were defending the city. So we know where it had to have been. And from that siege wall, people could not observe, you know, watchmen walking the wall, the siege wall, couldn't observe somebody bringing something out into that cliff over there. So I thought, okay, that makes it reasonable. We got ready, came back and started digging January 1979. It had come a real wet, sloppy snow that year. I mean, it was horrible. This thing had been filled with garbage. We found two dead cats in there. I've got a picture, a, a moving picture of a cat that came up to where we were working and it stood there and looked at us for a bit and then it just turned and walked off like, you know, what are you idiots doing there? But uh, anyway, in January 6, 1982, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I found the Ark of the Covenant. Right? You would not believe the amount of stone and dirt and everything we had made. God kept our interest up by thinking that just any minute we would find it. You know, for all of that time. Usually the carrot doesn't work for that long a period of time. I think you know about holding a carrot in front of something so to get it to move. So anyway, we found it. Now, I hadn't thought anything about the crucifixion site. Like everyone else, I thought it was up by that Muslim graveyard on top of that cliff. And in fact, I went up there looking one day for it, and a couple of Muslims kind of helped me off of the <laughs> out of the place. My feet touched the ground about every ten feet. <laughs> but anyway, I didn't see any evidence up there. But as we dug down the face of that cliff, we found those three cutouts. Now, folks, there was only one crucifixion site in Jerusalem, and that is it. Not only that, the place where they crucified people was the same place where they stoned the people, right? There's a very strong tradition, in fact, there's a big church built up there, where they supposedly stoned Stephen, 
remember the story in the Bible. And he said, I beheld heaven. He says, uh, I beheld heaven open, and I saw the Son of Man, or Jesus, sitting at the right hand of God. And there's a special, this is a special place up there. There's a book by that title for sale in there. And I suggest you get it. It's a very good book. So anyway, when I found the cutouts, we were digging along the cliff face, and the, the dirt out here was beginning to threaten to fall in on us and bury us. So I went to the left, dug a shaft straight down, and you know where that little bench, that curved bench is sitting out there, and that uh, pillar? By the way, those are pagan symbols. What they're doing in there, in a Christian place, is amazing. But it's a symbol of sun, sun worship, and the pillar is a phallic symbol, fertility symbol. They're not right over the Ark of the Covenant, but they're, I'm surprised they are even that close. So as we tunneled along at the quarry floor, at the base of the wall, I found the cross hole. And I worked around and found some more cross holes four feet lower on the real quarry floor. I thought this was the quarry floor, but actually it was a, a kind of a bench-like thing uh, where they hadn't taken the last set of blocks out as they quarried their way down. And so anyway, I prayed, Lord, where shall I go now? Now, we had found the crucifixion place, and I was quite excited about that. But we were looking for the Ark of the Covenant. And if I had had my way, I would have found the Ark of the Covenant, and I would not have found the crucifixion site, because I wasn't looking for it. As always, God had more in mind than I had in mind. As a, uh, more than any of us humans, he says, that he will give us more than we can ask or think. And I found that to be very true, and of course you will find that to be very true too, and some of you already have, those that are sharing things with other people. Because today God is taking a strong hand in finishing his work. Anyway, I was impressed to break right through the cliff. Not this cliff, but one that looked every bit as solid. Right? Well, <clears throat> I'm dumb, but I didn't think I was that dumb. Okay. So anyway, I kept looking around for a place to get in that cliff, I knew there were caves in there because honeybees were coming out of cracks and flying in. So they had their nests in there. So anyway, my youngest son, he says, Dad, have you prayed about this? And I said, yes, you know, I should have prayed with my sons. We look back and we see mistakes we've made. But he asked, and we did pray together at night and morning, but I should have prayed right there. Anyway, <clears throat> he said, did you pray about this? I said, yes. He says, well, did you get any indication of what to do? I said, yes. I'm supposed to break right through that cliff. And he says, well, let's do it. And I said, no way. That's stupid. I'm not doing it. So we worked for three or four more days, and it was time to leave the next day. And my older son was down, my oldest son was down with me and we were handing the tools out to my youngest son to store them and my older son is a rather quiet person. He said, Dad, did you pray about this? I said, sure, yes I did. He said, well, I said, I was impressed to break through that cliff right there. Yes, yes. And he said, well, let's do it. And I said, no. That's stupid. I am not beating my brains out against a cliff. He says, well, Dad, pardon my saying so, but I've seen you do stupider things than that. 
<laughs> I said, okay, y'all run need to pass the tools back now. Now, if you look carefully, you'll see a crack right here. Right? It's not much of one, but it is a fault line through that stone. So we went 18 inches over to this side, took our hammers and chisels and started marking the stone up and down and up and down. Finally, a big chunk popped out of there. Pushed it off to the side, looked back in the bottom. There was a small, dark hole about that big. It didn't look very promising at all. I had my son hand me the flashlight. We had had them sitting where we could see. This was all down in a tunnel. And so I put it up to that hole, and there was a big cave chamber back behind there. Have you ever had goosebumps and all of that sort of thing? Just overwhelm you? Well, that's what happened to me. It didn't take us very long to make the hole big enough to get in. I thought the Ark of the Covenant would be sitting right there. It wasn't. <laughs> okay. So since we had to leave the next morning, we plugged that hole. We came back to the surface, plugged the hole, fixed everything up so nobody could tell where we had been, and left. I had to go home, work, save up some more money, come back. But eventually, I found the Ark of the Covenant, and it was in a chamber that... I would not have bothered going in, just like I wouldn't have bothered breaking through the wall. My two sons had gotten very ill in 1982. Uh, uh, I sent one of them home Christmas Eve, the other one home New Year's Eve. I owed the hotel $300. I had no money at all. As a friendly Arab let me seat at his restaurant, and that, folks, to me is humiliating. Now, there are some things that I'm not comfortable with, and I was experiencing several of them that trip. I decided that I was going to find the Ark of the Covenant or die in the hole. This may sound a little melodramatic, but I was humiliated. I couldn't pay my bill at the hotel. I'd rather be dead than in a situation like that. And that's not good logic. So don't go down and do likewise on that one. So anyway, the, the little Arab guy that was letting us eat at his restaurant, he was a full-grown man, but he's about that tall and small, the teeth. So as we went through this cave system, he would crawl into the chambers, and I'd give him a light, and he'd shine it around, and I'd peek through to see if it looked like anything in there. So we did this over and over, and uh, we came to this one hole after we had, I mean, you wouldn't believe where all we had gone in that cave. However, how many of you have ever been inside a big cave, the tunnels and chambers and all? Hey, you know what I'm saying? We had just been all over the place, up and down, different levels, and at this point in time we had gone about 45 feet down and then back up. And here this hole was in the wall, about that big around, and it, there was a stalactite hanging right down the middle of it. It's the only stalactite I had seen in the cave that wasn't just little ones. This was a big one, and I have it in my collection of things. So I broke it off, made the hole big enough for him to get in, and he was crawling in there, and I started to hand him the light so he could do what we had been doing, you know, several days. He came tearing out of there, his mind, uh, eyes were big as human eyes can get, and he said, what's in there, what's in there, I'm not going back in there. And I said, well, what did you see? He said, I didn't see anything. And I thought, well, okay. Now, he had been in tighter places than that and had not responded that way. So I got this little beam of light, you know, in a very dark place here. And I thought, that is divine terror. 
you know, that's supernatural character. So I figured there's got to, that is either where the Ark of the Covenant is or it's the way to get to it, one or the other. And God doesn't want this fellow to know where it is. So anyway, he said, he, he just said, I, I, I must get out of here. So off he went. So I made the hole big enough for me to get in. I got in there and folks, it was full of rocks, bigger than these here up to within 18 inches or so of the seat. If this young man hadn't been terrorized and come scooting out of there like he did, I would not have gone in that place. But who needs rocks? We've been moving thousands of them for three years. So anyway, I crawled in there with the flashlight and I crawled around on top of the rocks and I shined the light down between the cracks in the rock and there a gold, flat gold thing reflected back at me. So I moved over and shined down through another. There was two reflections, one here, one there, and one over here. So I knew it was a flat gold top and I thought the Ark of the Covenant I forgot about the cherubims, you know, sitting on top. They'd have been poking up through if that was the top of the mercy seat. But anyway, I started moving these rocks, and I stuck them everywhere I could. By the time I got down to that gold surface, I had them behind my shoulders, leaning back against them, and uh, it, turned, it was the table of showbread. Well, hey, that's not a bad thing, huh? <laughs> But anyway, I was looking for the Ark of the Covenant. And it was only then that I took time to carefully examine the rest of the chamber. See, I had just crawled in, took a quick look, and started checking down under the rocks. So as I moved the flashlight along the wall, I saw a stone box sitting against the wall about this low, this much space between it and the ceiling. The lid was broke, slid around, and right above it was a crack with dark brown looking material at the bottom of, on the bottom of this crack. And I was able to see the top of the lid of the box. On both sides of the broken pieces was more of this brown stuff. All of a sudden, I realized I was sitting in front of the Ark of the Covenant, and that Christ's blood had come down. I had never heard anybody preach anything about that sort of possibility. And it was too much for me. I, when I regained consciousness and looked at my watch again, 45 minutes had passed from the time I crawled in the chamber because I figured I'd find the Ark of the Covenant in there. I wanted to know what time it was. So anyway, it was 2 o'clock when I entered the chamber. And after I regained consciousness, it was 2.45. I couldn't see down in there. But I knew what it was. So anyway, I was, the way I had gotten in there was approximately 90 feet through little tight squeezes and chambers and caves, uh, tunnels, and I knew I couldn't get it out. Now I had asked for a sign about the Ark of the Covenant, and that had to do with money. I needed $10,000. The IRS was given me a horrible time. They disallowed my deduction for my children. And I mean, they were uh, young teenagers, you know. They were not overage. There was no reason on earth why they should do that, except the devil controls the IRS. If God, and I, God allows it to some extent. There's a lot of things we will understand better later. I kind of felt that God picked on Job a bit, but there was a reason for it. Uh, you know, those of us who live down here, 
uh, will probably experience some things similar to that. But anyway, I sat there and I cried and I said, God, you promised me I would get this out this trip because I had gotten the $10,000 that I needed from an ex unexpected source. And so I got this big, strong impression, no, I promised you I, you would find it. It'll come out when the time is right. So I've been content with that ever since. Not totally happy because I'd like to get this mess over with very quickly, folks. But there are people that are being one to, the, to God every day on this earth. And he has plans to show every one of us what the truth is so that we can decide whether we love the truth, we love God for what he's done for us, and we will be loyal to him or whether we don't care. We'd rather have a good time. We'd rather, you know, go around doing things that will destroy us and will have a bad influence on others and help them be destroyed. I think most of you know the rest of the story. I'll quote a scripture text for you. In Matthew chapter 27, and it's not on there, uh, verses 50 through 51, it's talking about the crucifixion. It says, when he had cried again, he died. The veil of the temple was torn in half from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were rent. When I found the cross hole, I found a crack right along to the left side of it. When I saw this, I thought, okay, that proves that what was recorded in Matthew is accurate. The earth had cracked there, but I had no idea of why. The Ark of the Covenant, after all of this traveling around I had gone through this cave, was exactly 20 feet below where the cross hole was. And it was solid limestone between the two. And I suppose Satan was quite happy. He probably knew the blood of Christ was going to have to get on the mercy seat. He knows scripture a lot better than we do. And he was probably pretty happy. It can't get through 20 feet of solid limestone. When that crack opened up, and the centurion stuck his spear in Christ's spleen and probably the left ventricle of the heart. And all the blood and water, which was the platelets and the serum, blood is a mixture. It has to be constantly in motion, otherwise it separates out into serum and platelets. So when Christ died, the separation process began very shortly thereafter, the platelets clot and would be a big rubbery clump that would not have come out through a spear wound. So everything had to be timed perfectly. So the blood of Christ gushed out and went down through there, ratifying the old covenant and the new covenant as proof that God had accepted Christ's sacrifice. When Christ came out of his grave, it says many of the saints that were asleep, when he awoke, they awoke, and went into the holy city. So we have been bought with a price, folks. And if we neglect what God has done for us, that's the most horrible thing that can happen to anybody. Have you ever been in a situation where you thought you were too late? Or something real important to you or to somebody else you know I was supposed to meet somebody here I got hung up in traffic didn't make it and you know one of those kinds of feelings of it being too late God is offering every one of us salvation today we don't have any guarantees that it will still be there for tomorrow okay? now I don't believe in trying to scare people folks Christ died for you, the Son of God. Paid for us with his blood just a few feet from here. 
offering every one of us salvation today. We don't have any guarantees that it will still be there for tomorrow. Okay? Now, I don't believe in trying to scare people, folks. Christ died for you, the Son of God. Yes, he's doing it for that good son. Now, when I found this, there was no sign of any water had fallen in afterwards, and with a crack right above it, surface water, dirt, and stuff would be expected to have fallen in. And I wondered what happened. I had people ask me, and so I got to thinking about that. Well, Sunday morning, when the angel came down to roll back the stone so Christ could come out of the tomb, it said there was a mighty earthquake, right? I believe God closed the crack at that point. When we were there, the crack was only wide enough that by taking the tip off of a steel measuring tape, I was able to pass it through to make sure that the crack by the cross hole was the same one that came out over the mercy seat. We have to be thorough when we're doing God's work. We cannot be slip shot. Okay. So anyway, <coughs> that is where Christ bought and paid for us. Redeemed this planet from a usurper. Now, if you'll take the paper I gave you, I'd like to share something else with you. And I'll go through this quickly. You can read these uh, verses at your leisure. Abraham was directed by God to come to a place in the mountains of Moriah to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice. And it said, in a place that God had chosen. All right. You remember that Isaac, when they left the servants behind and they had the wood and everything, he told his dad, he says, we have everything here but a lamb. Where can we get a lamb? They were out in the boonies. And Abraham probably didn't realize it. But he's made a prophetic statement there. He said, God will provide it. Himself a lamb. The offering. I believe that was the same place that Christ was crucified. And as we move on through here, we find that Jacob passed this way. And he had a dream, and he saw heaven open and a ladder between heaven and earth. And angels coming and going, and he saw Christ at the head of the stairs. And he said, this is none but the gateway to heaven. This was a prophetic utterance, also directed by the Holy Spirit. Accurate. Absolutely accurate. <coughs> now, he was just north of Jerusalem. <coughs> if you're seeing something and it's straight above you, you don't get a very good view of it. You know, everything's just coming in your face. I believe that he looked at the reality. I doubt that angels use stairs or steps or ladders. But he said this is the gate to heaven. Okay? Now... <coughs> When they built the, in the other places here, God's chosen dwelling place is this city. It's here. The Temple Mount. All right? Now, God knew that the Jews were going to rebel. He knew all of that all the time. 
something that you might want to do when you get home, read Ezekiel, start at chapter 29 and go through there. It's quite enlightening. God said of the priests, because they have polluted themselves among the heathen and have defiled my place by bringing these people into my temple, he said they will no more come near my holy things in my most holy place. All right? But he said they shall offer the blood and the fat at my table. Excuse me, if you read those chapters, you will find that the Israelites were directed to build a chest. It gives the size, all of that, and it says, and it shall be called the table of the Lord. In the second temple, in the most holy place, was this table. Titus carried it off with the candlesticks and all of that. In the first couple of chapters of Ezra, it tells us that when some of the ancient men and some of the priests that had lived through the whole captivity and were back here, it says when they saw the foundation of the second house, after having seen the first one, it says they wept, right? This means that those priests, some of them had officiated in the holy place and knew what the table of showbread looked like, they knew what the candlesticks looked like, they knew what the golden altar of incense looked like, but there was nobody there that knew what the Ark of the Covenant looked like, because the high priest was dead. Right? So anyway, they made replicas of what had been in the holy place, but they were instructed to build this table of the Lord for the most holy place. Now, God directed that the Ark of the Covenant and all of the furnishings of the first temple and the wilderness tabernacle should be put in a cave chamber that's 12 feet wide, 22 feet long, and approximately average of 18 feet high. That is God's holy things, and that is His most holy place, because the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat that was the earthly throne of God, where it was placed was called the most holy place. So there is the most holy place to this day. And it's where the blood of Jesus that fulfilled all of the types and shadows of the sanctuary service rests today. Now we shared the first John chapter five verses seven, eight, and nine with you on the bus. Remember that? There are three that keep record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. These three are one. There are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of man, the witness of God is greater, and this is God's witness and testimony of His Son. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 and 6, There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, to be testified in due time. Folks, that's the place. And what the Bible tells us is that this is God the Father's proof to a lost world that they have been redeemed by the blood of His Son. Right? That is the Father's proof. When people have seen this and become aware of this, if they reject that, there's nothing else to follow. That is the heart and soul of the plan of salvation. And He has told us, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. In other words, it don't matter what we've done in the past. It doesn't matter how weak and sinful our natures are. Christ made provision for all of that. And he died for us. All we have to do is go to the Father in the name and blood of the Son and ask for forgiveness and rehabilitation so we become Christ-like and we will be ready at His coming. And folks, when the Holy Spirit sets up housekeeping in our hearts, 
we will develop a love for lost souls that will constrain us to do those things which are very inconvenient, time-consuming, expensive, and all of that, and that is working for lost souls. And when Christ comes, instead of fleeing and trying to hide from the face of him that sits on the throne, we'll look up and say, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. And he will save us. And that's our choice today. Now let's get back to this. What I'm saying here is that this is God's contact. It's the umbilical cord, if you please, between God, heaven, the central heaven, and this lost planet. Now of all the experiences I've had, the most thrilling. I was holding a meeting over in North Carolina one afternoon. I'd shown the videos of all the discoveries and I was giving people an opportunity to ask questions. Well, somebody said, Ron, do you camp out when you go on these digs? And I said, no, I stay in a cheap hotel, the Jerusalem Hotel. I said, I got all the camping out and more than I wanted when I was in the Army. And I don't know, I, people that hadn't had that experience, some folks like camping, but I guarantee you I don't. No bother inviting me to go camping with you. <clears throat> it's not something I do. Unless, of course, when the Sunday laws passed and they're about to try to kill us or something, I might be motivated, you know, to do that. But anyway, somebody else said, well, when are you going back? And I said, around the middle of September. Well, what I didn't know, there was a doctor out there in the audience. And, of course, doctors, a lot of them have some a fair amount of money, and he didn't bother to ask me, but when my day crew and I showed up at the Jerusalem Hotel on the 15th of September that year, he was sitting on the top of the steps. Well, all of a sudden my whole world crashed, folks, because I knew I couldn't work on the Ark of the Covenant with that guy there, because he hadn't asked hadn't, you know, asked if it was all right. And godly people ask. They don't just pop up like that. And so I thought, well, some of my mistakes, and they're considerable, has cut me off from God. He can't use me anymore in this work. So I just said, Lord, I'm sorry. Whatever it was. If I can help whoever you want to finish this, I'll be delighted. So anyway, we did some landscaping in the garden tomb. They had collected years of junk and debris in there, and we hauled off, I think it was like 15 truck, big dump truck loads of trash out of the back of the garden out there. And uh, so anyway, I was, we had a fan. It was real hot that year. And this fan was moving enough air to make it livable, and then the thing sputtered and sparked and quit. Well, that was kind of like Job's gourd vine. I'm not Job's, but uh, Jonah, thank you. Jonah's gourd vine to me when that went, you know, the last drops of my courage went along with it. And I was sitting there feeling hopeless. I figure if you blow something that important that not only are you out of a job, but you're lost. And I was extremely depressed. Then I heard a voice, a very kind voice, say, God bless you and what you're doing here. Have you ever had somebody say, call your name and say, what are you doing? And you knew that they knew what you were doing, like your mother or your dad one, or who did this, and you know they know who did it. Well, I knew that whoever that voice belonged to knew more than I had told anybody. Because I don't tell everybody everything I'm doing and, and where and all of this. You can't nowadays. So anyway, 
I looked up and startled to see who this was. And folks, it was the being whose crucifixion site I had found the noose blood I had found on the mercy seat. And I sat there stunned. I don't know how long. This doctor, when the pain quit, he, did you all walk out to the top of that little sidewalk that goes towards the chapel? Uh, and then, did you all walk out there where you turn left and go down to the lower level? I was sitting flat on the ground in front of that chapel. He was standing at the end of that sidewalk up above me there. I got a real good look at him, but the doctor didn't. He was back, had scooted back under the bushes to get some shade and was eating his lunch. Well, when I kind of got over my shock, I wanted to make sure it was Christ. You remember Thomas? He wanted to put his fingers in his in the wounds. I didn't think of that or I'd probably ask for that. But anyway, I said, do you live around here, sir? He said, no. I said, are you a tourist? He said, no. I didn't know what else to say. So I just sat there, looked at him, kindest face I ever saw in my life. He said, I'm on my way from South Africa to the New Jerusalem. Well, that kind of eliminated any possibilities of it being an earthly being. And then he looked at me again and said, God bless you. And what you're doing here. You would have had to have been there, folks, and in the same situation I was in to know what a relief that was. He turned and walked back to the main sidewalk through the place, went back towards the gift shop, and as you know, you can't get out of there without passing that area. So at the end of the day, I asked the people in there, I said, what did you think of that tall, princely looking man that was dressed in ancient Jewish garb? And they looked at me real funny, and they said, well, Mr. Wyatt, there's Nobody like that been in here today. And then they thought for a minute and they said that there's never been anybody like that in here. So somewhere between where we were and the entrance, he had disappeared. But what I believe, folks, is what Jacob said about this being the gateway to heaven. I think that's God's place where the angels come to this earth and go out to do their work, come back there and ascend to heaven. And I think that the Son of God is at work on this earth. In fact, he's right here today. Where two or three are gathered, together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. If you to, and if it would help somebody get to heaven that wouldn't otherwise, he could, he would reveal himself today. But he will reveal himself to each of you. When we do meetings, when we do tours, we ask God to send people along that he wants to be there and that will benefit from the experience. He knows who they are, I don't. Then I ask him to help me say exactly what he wants to say. And then I ask him to open the door of salvation to everyone in attendance. I ask that in the name of the blood of Jesus. I can guarantee before God today that if you folks just breathe a simple prayer, Lord, please forgive and cleanse me and help me 
to be one of your good and faithful servants in Jesus' name and by his blood. He will accept you. I could waste an entire lifetime working with people. I'm sure a lot of you have had opportunities to talk to folks and they kind of dangle the carrot. Well, you know, I'm thinking about it. That you can waste a lot of time working with somebody like that and there's no intent of ever coming over and giving their hearts to the Lord. Satan can get us wasting time with those kinds of people and we don't spend time with those who will respond. We need to ask God to use us as he did the early disciples. And he can work out everything he knows who will respond. You folks here will respond, otherwise you would not be here. I expect to see every one of you in heaven. I don't know what you'll have to go through before you'll be ready for that experience, but God does. And he says he's able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before his throne of grace. Right? So the door of salvation is open to you folks. Let's close your eyes, say a little prayer, and then we get to go to lunch. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us. I don't understand why. I doubt that anybody here does. We apologize for all of our pitiful attempts to please you and to be used of you to work for others. We're so thankful for your precious Son and our precious Savior and your promise that you'll send your Holy Spirit to dwell in our hearts and our minds and that we'll hear a word behind us saying, this is the way, walk in, when we turn to the right hand and when we turn to the left. You know everyone here. You love everyone here. Your son died for all of us. We ask that you'll please continue to bless these people as only you are wise and powerful and loving enough to do. Give them the joy of working for you in your vineyard and seeing the lost, the hopeless, learn of you and come to you in the name and blood of your son that they might find the joy of salvation. We ask that you'll make a quick end to what Satan has done and is doing to your creatures on this earth. We ask that you'll please help us not to contribute to the horrible things he's doing. And we ask that you'll please not let anyone be lost, that you can use us in any way to help them come to you and be saved. In Jesus' name and by his blood we pray. And thank you for hearing granting our request. Amen. Amen.